Uh, well, as introduced, we are covering the shipwreck Brunswick, which is the same British East Indiaman from the previous presentation, uh, and we're using that as a case study for site formation processes in Simon Space, South Africa. We're both master's candidates at East Carolina University. Uh, quick mention on the site description of Brunswick or a recap. This is the site plan from Project Sandalwood in 1995. You can see the primary hull section right there with some secondary hull fragments here. There was some limited excavation during this time that I'll talk a little bit more about later. But you can see there are iron knees, copper bolts, and some loose planking spread throughout the wreck. <coughs> On the right here is a bottom profile that shows how much the Brunswick wreckage still sticks up from the sea floor. Upon our investigation, the deepest point of wreckage was at 6 meters, and the uppermost part, where it's where the keelson was, stuck at 1.5 meters above the sea floor, so 4.5 meters below the below sea level. On the left here, is a multi-beam image, the same one I showed you earlier of the Brunswick. You can see that there's been some re-coverage of the, uh, or some some sediment coverage has, has been completed on secondary hull fragments, but the primary hull fragment still sticks up a lot above the sea floor. On the right is a GPS map created using Google Earth and using GPS coordinates taken in July 2014 during the ECU investigation, showing the complete area covered by the Brunswick debris field. A uh, quick recap on the wrecking event. It was brought into Simonstown Harbor in September 1805. It wrecked September 18, 1805, and it was pushed up onto shore when its cables break. The likely cause of the wrecking event was a faulty hawse pipe that snapped. Um, when, it, when it washed up on sea, it was broken up on sand and rocks. Now, what this means for our site formation is that our wreckage or debris field is spread out. It's broken up. You're dealing with shattered and destroyed remains and you have components that were washed out to sea or up onto beach. When they're washed up on the beach, you obviously have incidental salvage as local town inhabitants come down and pick up anything that's washed up. And it is also possible that any ships or boats that were out at sea at that point, moment picked up any of the floating wreckage. Again, this is the same image that you saw earlier with the bottom on the left and then the Brunswick being broken up on the right by wave action on the rocks. Uh, I'll, Nathan King is going to cover natural effects. I'll hand it over to him right now. So on on the wreck of the, on the wreck of Brunswick, we have various natural effects that are occurring. We have a predator prey cycle that's going on with starfish and mussels. We have current and tide activity that's uh, covering and uncovering the wreck, and we have the stingy stingus. Stingus. It's a Dutch word. Don't speak it. And octopuses <laughs> um, that are also causing some issues on on the wreck. Um, we're also going to talk about the copper bolts, some of the natural effects that are going on with those. And uh, you heard Jeremy already kind of touch on water temperature and weather in the Cape area. This is actually located in False Bay uh, rather than Table Bay, so which is actually more of a winter anchorage for ships that were coming in into uh, into Cape Town. So, so with this predator prey cycle, you have black mussels that like to colonize on the Brunswick. Um, they're you're just a typical mussel. They're a bivalve feeder. They attach with bifid threads to the actual wood structure on the wreck. Um, by the time that it's winter, so whenever we there was a winter time period, the starfish have already started to move on. They've moved on to, to different feeding grounds in the bay, and you have um, the mussel population begins to rebuild. So that by the time early summer hits, the starfish have returned and have begun to prey upon all the mussels. And so we haven't really defined any, any set time cycle. We don't know that if it's exactly June 2nd or if it's, you know, March 4th. But we know that this cycle occurs at an annual rate. Um, the starfish will remain until they have just completely depleted the mussel population, and then they move on. As far as site formation goes, the mussel shells can assist in forming a protective conglomerate over the, over the vessel. But we haven't really discerned any effect, though, from starfish feeding behavior. So when starfish are feeding, they actually pull the mussel open and then turn their stomach inside out, put it inside the mussel, dissolve the mussel, pull it back in, and move on to the next one. And then the mussel shells will fall apart, and then as the wave action goes on, the shells get broken up and form this conglomerate. Um, unlike what, what some, um, some people have written about zebra mussels in the Great Lakes, there's no time for these mussels to form any sort of bacteria latent mat um, underneath the colony. So you have since you have this constant eating and rebuilding of the mussels, there's no time for this map to form, which doesn't, which couldn't do anything to increase degradation of any of the copper or the iron artifacts, because mussels really like to live on iron. Um, so, okay, so the currents and tides. Uh, the shipwreck is subject to the Alcus and the Bengula currents. 
So the um, Bengula brings in cold water while the Alcoos brings in warm water. Um, there's a nearby breakwater that was constructed when Simontown, uh, Simonstown built a harbor. And it benefits the Brunswick in similar in the way that Jeremy talked about um, how the building of the Cape Town Harbor adjusted the wave and wave activity there. Because um, prior to the construction of this, uh, the vessel was vulnerable to storms and current, current activity, which could damage the wreck uh, through various natural effects. So for the side formation, this vessel is in a shallow water location. There's seasonal deposition of, of sediments and typical unpredictable storm surface. The stenches and octopuses, um, the male stenches expose portions of the wreck during mating season. So what their activity is, is they'll find what they think is a great location, and the males will fan and make a one meter diameter by about 40 centimeter deep hole in the ground, just a big giant hole to try and attract the female fish so they can, they can mate. And what this has a tendency to do is it can expose any buried portions of the shipwreck to, um, it can expose it back to, to water, different, uh, different conditions. And then the octopuses, they decorate their burrows, openings with artifacts, broken glass, pottery shirts, uh, whatever. So with that, you kind of lose provenience and context, and it can be kind of annoying. Um, in, I believe it was 95 they found, 2012, they found three burrows, three active octopus burrows located by the, wait, let's see, there, there, and there. Um, they found those on the Brunswick. Each one had had, you know, a few dis disarticulated artifacts. Um, so for site formation, the stenches uncover portions of the wreck and increases degradation due to exposure. And the octopuses can destroy contacts and remove and bury artifacts. So the copper bolts, you have differential aeration corrosion. The bolts are exposed to different environments, wood, water, or sand. Some bolts are uncovered, as um, you see in this one, there's some covers sticking straight up. Some are more buried or they're, they're more uh, protected by the kelp overgrowth, um, sponges, you know, anemones and things like that. Um, some are continuously exposed to sand in the case of these two, so the constant water activity moving the sand across the copper, you know, wears it down. And, you know, these ones we were diving on the wreck, they were as shiny as if they were brand new. So all of that sand is constantly moving across it, uh, wearing away the um, that little green layer that forms on the outside of copper. So the site formation uh, can skew the measurements on the boat, so you make it hard to get an average measurement for all the copper bolts. It causes gradual warping of the bolts, increased degradation, and can also, but it can also preserve the bolts in the case of, of that one there, which is more protected by um, cover, being covered and being protected by kelp and overgrowth. So Ebor will now talk about more of the cultural effects. So once again, these are all the cultural effects here. I'll be focusing on the ones in red in the following slides. A uh, quick note on the other ones, souvenir. Uh, it was for a long time common in South African waters for divers to bring up souvenirs during their dives. In the 90s, there was an amnesty period where divers could bring their souvenirs back to the authorities without fear of any legal penalty. There's a small collection of these artifacts that has formed with the Ezekiel Maritime Center for Brunswick. Diving was very common on Brunswick. It is a shallow water, an easy training wreck. It's very flat. There's very, and very little current for divers to practice. However, with the creation of two cement barges further up, up Long Beach, diving has decreased on Brunswick. However, in the 90s, um, you saw about 30 to 40 divers a month going down on Brunswick. There's no, there's no record of the number of dives that these guys made, however. Uh, and Simonstown Harbor has been a historical harbor for the past 250 years. Uh, as such, it has been used as for military, civilian, and commercial purposes, and you've got a whole bunch of garbage that has formed up on Brunswick. We brought previous projects, brought up non-contemporary bottles, beer cans, cigarette butts, you know, you name it, we probably found it. Uh, so just a quick note on the historic salvage, a advertisement in the Cape Town Gazette and African Advertiser um, put put these goods up for public auction. As you can see here, there's up to 70,000 pounds of valuable sandalwood that was sold, 100,000 pounds of iron knees, 30,000 pounds of wrought iron, several boats, and a collection of timbers. Uh, this was all purchased by an American captain for the price of 35,000 Reichs dollars. At the time, that equates to about 4,300 pounds. Uh, what this means for our site formation is that we've got an obvious loss of artifacts that goes undocumented. You've got interruption of natural processes. 
as the wreck is probably re-exposed or you interrupt other processes. And finally, you've also got damage from early salvage techniques as they brought things up and ripped things up. And there. Modern salvage has also been, has also affected Brunswick. Uh, there was, in 1967, Jim Knowles, an American salver, was looking for sellable scrap in Simons Bay Park, in Simons Bay. He found a rudder that was covered in copper sheeting and decided to bring it up with his partner. He used a crane to lift it up, leaving one gudgeon attached to the remains on the sea floor. He brought it up to a beach, realized he couldn't bring it over the neighboring railway ride, refloated the harbor, brought it to Simons Bay jetty, and put it there for two days. That's where it ended up here, with two Navy, Navy boats, when, boats mates sitting on it. Um, originally, it was thought to be the Bato's Brunswick, but later research confirmed that it was actually part of Brunswick's wreckage. Um, during that time, it was left for two days on the jetty while it was, uh, transportation was arranged. And as such, a lot of the copper sheeting that was on the, on the rudder was stolen or removed in other illicit activities. Uh, you also have a case of incomplete conservation with the rudder as only a light layer of fungicide was, was applied. And there was no further conservation that was taken. It is currently located at the Zico Slave Lodge Museum in Cape Town. Uh, the South Africa, the South African Navy maintains a base in Simons Bay. Uh, it is also the headquarters for the South African Naval Diving Unit. Uh, they have ta undertaken training, training dives in the, in the area, and Brunswick has suffered as a result. Brunswick was used as a, as a training wreck, and the copper bolts that Nathan talked about earlier have actually been removed. These guys used to stick up to about 60 centimeters up from the sea floor. Navy divers thought this was a perfect opportunity for them to practice salvage work and decided to remove them using coping saws. Uh, you can see actually if you look at this bolt there's still some saw marks on the top there and it is perfectly flat on top. Um, the evidence of this also exists in personal communication with project members. This took place during Project Sandalwood, and they found a pile of 20 to 30 broken saw blades next to these bolts. Um, so it, they must have been down there for quite some time. Um, now what this means for site formation is you've got accelerated decay as there was re-exposure of the wreck, you've got improper recording upon the removal of artifacts, and you've got a loss of artifacts. We have no idea where these bolts are, and the Navy doesn't either. Uh, archaeology has been a constant factor in Brunswick's recent past over the past 20 years. Uh, in Project Sandalwood 1993 to 1995 was the biggest archaeological investigation on the wreck. There was some small-scale ex excavation and uncoverage, um, and a complete map was formed that you see on the right here. A grid system was used to, to map it. The, ma the grid was or the grid was made of PVC pipe that did anchor into the seafloor, however, care was taken to not damage the remains. In 2012 and 2013, the University of Cape Town conducted an environmental assessment under Jake Harding. There was no large-scale disturbance at all, as most of this was just simply an observance exercise. He, he dove, he left only bubbles, and took only pictures. Um, in some cases, they did go back and take some multi-beam images, but this again does not affect the natural processes on the wreck. In July 2013, ECU came in and did its own archaeological survey. Uh, this took the form of a pre-disturbance survey with limited any re-exposure of the wrecks. There was only some light hand fanning. Um, there was, however, some targeted wood sampling shown here, but the samples removed were no larger than one cubic centimeter and should not affect the uh, the decay of the timber remains in any significant way. What this does mean for site formations is that there was some limited artifact removal, especially during Project Sandalwood. Some of the context was destroyed, but archaeology is a destructive science, and care was taken to record the contents in every, every, well, in every case. There's an interruption of natural processes. The wreck is re-exposed. The previous image shows that sediment has recovered some of the wreckage, and that it does help in the preservation of that. And, of course, there is the re-exposure of sugar. Finally, we just, this might seem a little repetitive from the last one. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank Sarah, the Ezekiel Maritime Center, Pisces Divers Cape Town, ECU's Program in Maritime Studies, in this case, only Justin Edwards and James Smiles, and Daniel King's right here. And I'd like to thank Dr. <laughs> thank you very much.